afternoon, everyone. I know um, some of you are still checking in, that's fine, but I want to go ahead and get started on time. Uh, my name is Katie Pickert, and I will be your moderator. This is the session on Connections, the Last Bastion of Rational Design. So with that being said, your speaker today is Bill Thornton, or <laughs> some people refer to him, the King of Connections. He is a corporate consultant to Seve's Corporation. He also serves on the technical committees for AISC, ASCE, AWS, and RCSC. He's also the chairman on the AISC Committee of Manuals for over 20 years. So, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. You might be wondering what the title means. Uh, somebody asked me yesterday, where did I get this title? Well, it's sort of like a, you know, kind of a poetic thing. I mean, if you're doing battle, you know, there's a last bastion of this or that or the next thing. And the idea here is that most design, most routine design these days is done by computer. You've got Ramsteel, Risa, Etabs, Stad, Strudel, and a lot of the design of really fairly complex buildings is pretty routine. It's just a matter of having a computer program and having the, you know, the geometry and the loads and uh, you can just run it and you get an answer. Whether it's right or not is another matter. But putting it together is another matter entirely. There is hardly any software out there that does connection design, other than the simplest possible connection designs, the ones you can find in the AISC manual, you know, shear connections, double clips, single angles, shear tabs, etc. When you get into real connections, you've got to know what you're doing. And that's really what, what, what the title here stands for. If you want to, 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 to design connections, you have to understand how they work. You cannot rely on anybody else's software to do it. So that's kind of the gist of the title. I mean, I have another title for it here. Connections, the art, sci art science and information and the quest for economy and safety. Being a fabricator engineer, it's always been my quest to come up and do things as economically as possible, but safely. To come up with ways that are unassailable in terms of the theory, but are also fairly economic. I've, been a, I've given this to talks like this now for some time. This, I mean, it's not, this one will not be the same one you've, that you've seen before or any of you have, 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 have heard me talk, but it's got parts of the same thing in it. There was a talk I gave at the uh, Structural Engineers Association of Kentucky where I said it's getting so in structural design that you know, the janitor can do it. And I got a lot of feedback, negative, that, you know, that's really not very professional to say something like that. But I think it's true. For ordinary, simple buildings, square buildings, beams and columns and that sort of thing, you don't really need a lot of expertise to do it. And what I, point I was trying to make with the, with the audience that I had there is that, that if, you, if you're a young engineer, and I don't see too many here, but some of you are really computer oriented, know exactly how to do all this stuff, but you need to know more than that if you're going to be a good engineer. You need to pick some area and become expert at it. Connections is one of them. It happens to be the one that I picked. But I mean, if all you can do is run somebody else's computer program, eventually, like 10 years from now, you might be making twice what you're making now, but there'll be people coming out of college that can do what you can do. You have got to learn to do better than that. And this is one area. There's, you know, there's dozens of other areas that you could get into to become expert. Anyway, to lead in, I've got this quote from John Dowling. He was the, the uh, president of the Structural, Institute, Structural Engineers Institute of the UK, and he made this statement. Any fool can design a structure. It takes an engineer to design a connection, and that's part of my theme. What he, this is part of a deposition for a collapse of a ferry terminal in England, where the entire structure was designed by computer, but the ramp details, the connections of the ramp to the structure, were not done 
right in his opinion and the whole ramp fell on the brink during a storm and a lot of people died cars trucks everything went in the water and as part of his deposition he said you know as far as the structure goes anybody can do it but as far as doing the details the connections for this ramp they were not done properly how about this one innovative detailing think that looks good? There's all kinds of weird stuff going on now. Look at that column, a fairly hefty column that starts and stops with a light spandrel running through it. And if you look in the back, you'll see a lot of deep beams framing to shallow beams. Why does this happen? Maybe because the computer spits it out this way. You can't depend upon the computer to do it right. The only thing a computer is going to do is going to give you a, a, an equilibrium distribution of forces, but it might not really be economic. Well, this one, <laughs> ductal seismic design. For those of you that saw a doctor uh, uh, we'll talk this morning showed similar connections for seismic, where the, where the, where the, where the, uh, the bracing connections all meet in the middle. And this is an older one, but I mean, just look at that. That's not going to work. That's not going to be ductal. On the other hand, this is the job that we did, where we, we were, a great attention was, was paid to the, to the details. It was the, the Hearst Tower in New York City. It's about 46, 48-story building. And we spent two years in my office designing all the connections for this job. And you'll see a couple of them on this slide. And this one was, a, was, a, was what was called a homework problem on that job. Every bidder that bid the job had to prove that they could design this connection, which is one of the corner, corners of the tower at the 10th floor. It's carrying 13,000 pounds coming into that diagonal that you see there, and there's another one coming out of the paper, out of the screen at you. There's two of them that come together at the corner, and there's a huge girder up there that connects all this stuff together. I, there is no computer program that will do this for you. Here's the node. There's hundreds of these on this job. I mean, the computer program assumes that that thing is a node, is a single infinitesimal point, and all the columns frame to it. To put it actual, actually together to make it work, you get something like what you see here. This detail was not shown by the engineer. This is one that, that, that myself and Larry Muir came up with that could be erected. We had 35,000 pages of output. I don't know how many load conditions that we had to go through to come up with this connection for the, for the entire job. We basically, we, did the, we looked at the whole job, we did the worst one, and we picked the one that controlled, and that's what you see here. This, this building's been occupied now, I think, for about two years. So that's a, a, in, in, by way of a preamble. You know, you saw some really crummy connections to start with where nobody's paying attention, and then you, I think you saw some really good ones that are not simple connections. There's absolutely no software in the world that would do the connections on this Hearst Tower. You need to develop the expertise to do this sort of work if you want to get involved in, 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 in complex jobs. There's three kinds of connections that I'll talk about a little bit here in the next hour or so. And I think I should be able to get done in an hour. There's simple connections, which I say have a unique load path. These are shear connections and really moment connections essentially have a unique load path as well. For these kind of connections, the main thing is to not require that the connections be designed for the strengths of the members. This one says, for economy, for shear connections, do not require connections to be based on UDL. That's the uniform design load. And why is that? What is UDL? It's the uniform design load based on flexural strength. It's the load that, comp that fully stresses a simply supported, uniformly loaded beam at its center. And the next slide here, design for strength. It's absolutely necessary to design for strength, but even Hardy Cross, who you might remember from moment distribution said, but it's not very important. Because most beams are not designed for strength. They're designed for stiffness. You have displacement limitations like, like 1 over 360. You've got this, uh, uh, vibration limitations. All of these things really size almost every beam on a job. You, true, you need to check them for flexor, for strength, but almost every beam is designed for, for stiffness, not strength. 
So therefore, the beam's going to be a lot stronger than it needs to be to carry the actual loads. And if you use the, that strength of the beam to come up with the connections, the connections are going to be a lot stronger than they need to be to carry the load. When beam reactions are based on strength, they will often be much larger than the actual reactions. Nevertheless, we see this kind of stuff in, in our contract documents. All shear connections, just fill it up with bolts, number one there. Fill it up with bolts. That may or may not be safe. And I don't have examples for all of this here, but if you go back to my 1995 TR lecture, and before that in 1992, there was another paper that, that showed that just filling up with bolts may or may not be safe. Or design all connections for half UDL, or any percentage of UDL. Or design shear connections for the shear capacity of the beam, which is almost impossible to achieve with any kind of a simple connection. Or item four here doesn't look too onerous. The w, look at the W10 and the, and the C10, 15 kips. Minimum load that you have to design it for. What people do, and what everybody's trying to do here, is to minimize the amount of time and effort that they have to put in for this. So if you have W10 beams and, and W12 12s and W14s, you review your, your, your structural drawings and you pick the one that's got the worst load, the highest load, and you say, let's do them all that way. The high see a W10, it might not be a W10 by 22, it could be a heavier one, but the maximum reaction that we have on that is 15 kips, so let's just put that on there, we're safe if we do that. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're safe. <clears throat> let's look at a UDL example. UDL is a problem with short span beams. Strength is inversely proportional to the span, so as the span gets small, the, the, the strength gets huge, it goes to infinity. I know, you can't get there, but I mean it gets, just gets large. So look, this is a, a, an actual case that we did some 15 years ago. This was just a concrete batching platform in South Carolina. It had a grating, a grating floor on it. And look at section AA there, right in the middle. We have some W10 by 22s that are three feet long. The requirement on this job was to design for half UDL. That's what was in the contract. We did not take exception to it. I mean, we should have, but we didn't. And the engineer was adamant that we shall design for half UDL. Half UDL for that little beam is 60, almost 62 kips on each end, which means that that beam's carrying something like 62 tons. And the next slide shows you in perspective what that means. <laughs> <clears throat> There's my beam down there, and I got an M1A1 Abrams battle tank sitting on top of it. I'm glad everybody laughs. You have to laugh at this. But because it's just total overkill, and it's a waste of money. It's a waste of our money, the fabricator, if, you know, we don't qualify our bid. If we do or, or if we don't and we put in a price for this to the owner and we get it, the owner's going to pay for this. And it's ridiculous because you'd never, ever have a load like that on this beam. What if you had a really, really heavy industrial floor load? of a thousand pounds per square <clears throat> foot, and I think you'll agree that's probably three times what you might expect on even in an industrial situation. You'd only still only get 7.7 .7 kips. So what is that telling us? The UDL load of 61.8 is like eight times a very high but possibly realistic load. I mean, somebody's paying for this. Either we do if we miss it, or the owner is if we, if we, if we bid it with this in it. But even think of that, that chart I had for the W10, I had minimum load of 15 kips. That's still twice what I would have for this, for 1,000 pounds per square foot. So I mean, this, when I say that it's eight times, it's probably 25 times the actual load that you'd actually have on, on a little beam like that. So, who really cares? UDL is safe, it's convenient, saves a lot of time in our office. And this is one of the problems that, that, that I have anyway with, with, with engineers designing connections. I'm not saying they can't do it, but they want to do it as quickly and cheaply and as, with as few hours as possible. So, but who cares? Let's just use UDL. I mean, it's 
probably the most common requirement on most jobs even today. In spite of my proselytizing for, what, 18 years or something, it's still done this way. <clears throat> Is it safe? Well, maybe not. Here's a job. It wasn't our job, but it was somebody's job that I got photographs of. Both of these beams were designed for a UDL requirement, let us say one half UDL. It obviously looks screwy, right? <clears throat> the end connection of the supported beam has nearly twice the capacity of the end connection of the support end beam. But they're both designed for one half UDL. But it's not right. It doesn't make sense, and it isn't safe. On this particular job, and it was not ours, I was told that when the engineer went to the job site and saw this, he said, wait a minute, you know, we fouled up here, you know, and he admitted it, and what they did is put a stiffened seat under the supporting beam on these things to pick up the sum of the two loads, which is what you would have to do. So UDL, it, you could see that it's definitely not economic, and it may not be safe unless you're careful about what you're doing. So to summarize on this, designing Shear connections for UDL is neither economic, you could clearly see that, I mean like 25 times the actual load, nor safe. <clears throat> now there, of course, there are no things you, that you can do. You could modify your, your specification and say that all loads that are within three feet of the end of a beam are included in addition to the uniform load. There's other things that can be done. But does everybody do it? Do you even think about it? On this particular job that I showed you here, I imagine that originally the, the beam that was the support ed beam probably framed to the column direct, but the architect at some point changed it, needed a bigger opening, and they moved it off center and didn't fix it, which is you know, what happens when you have changes on jobs. If the actual reactions are specified or given, and there's no big deal in doing that now with things like ram steel, There'd be no excuse for who's ever doing these connections to not get it right. So, for safety and cost, <clears throat> again repeating what was on our previous slide, who really cares? UDL is safe, convenient, it saves a lot of time in our office. Yeah, it does. But the time saved in the engineer's office on connection design can translate into a great expense to the owner. Since 50 percent, 40 or 50 percent of the cost of, a ruck, of erected structural steel is involved one way or another in the connections. And so it really is a big deal to the owner and to the fabricator too because the connections really are the only things that we would do different than any other fabricator. We all buy the steel from the same place. Another simple connection, I'm not going to talk about this anymore here except for this one slide, is moment connections. Moment connections basically have a unique load path, more or less. I agree there's some variations, but the standard one for static design is that the moments carried by the flanges and the shears carried by the web. For seismic, that's not quite true. Some of the web carries some, some of the moment. For, for for a Ashto, for highway bridge design, that's not true. That the, 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 it's, a, it's an elastic approach, and the, whatever the web capacity in, in bending is, that part of the moment is carried by the web. But for normal structures, non-seismic or low-seismic, static designs, the, flanges are, the, the flange connections are designed for the moments, and the shear is carried by the web. And all I'm saying here is, if, for, for economic design of moment connections, if for the engineers here, provide the actual moments. Tell us what they are. And separate the gravity and lateral moments because gravity moments almost never will require double plates, but lateral moments will almost always require double plates if the column is fairly light. So it really makes a big deal to us, to the, to the connection designers, to, to know what these moments are. How much is lateral? How much is gravity? Anyway, the next set of slides here have got to do with bracing connections, which I think are probably the most interesting of all of, of the three varieties. I'm calling these complex connections because they have multiple load paths. And because they have multiple load paths, there's various different ways to do them. There's not just one way to do these connections, but there might be one best way to do them. 
And the best way to do a, well, a bracing connection is a function sometimes of the, of the configuration of the, of the, the, the uh, situation. We don't know the distribution of forces in the structures we design. You may think you do, but you don't. So we don't know the distribution of forces in bracing connections either. If you think you know the distributions of the forces in your building because you've used STAD or Strudel or one of these programs, you really don't. You've got a, you've got a statically admissible internal force field and you've satisfied the limit states and you've satisfied compatibility, but you really don't know whether you've got the true solution because there's a million uh, assumptions that you've made, such as these. I mean, you're assuming the material is isotropic. It's sort of, but not quite. Homogeneous, not quite either. Elastic, well, it's not perfectly elastic. It's elastic and maybe possibly some, some uh, of uh, some inelastic, inelasticity in it. Some of it might be viscoelastic. I mean, there's all kinds of things going on that make it quasi-elastic. But you're assuming it's elastic. Or perfectly plastic. Or you're assuming the joints are pinned. Or the joints are fixed. Or the beams are laterally supported. Maybe they're not quite. Or they're torsionally restrained, which they have to be torsionally strained generally for the, for the lateral torsional buckling equations in the AISC spec to work. <clears throat> Are they? There's questions about that, especially if you have double copes. And many, many more. There's all kinds of assumptions that are made, and all of these assumptions affect the accuracy of what you end up with. This, for example, is a pinned connection. Right? <laughs> Does that look pinned? That's a pinned connection. Those gusset plates are... Are, are, are two inches thick, the bolts are inch and a quarter A490, slip critical, class B. The, the members are 14 by 500 pound sections. This was designed as it would, though it was pin connected. Is it? No, it's not pin connected. Is that an acceptable way to do it? It is, yes, except possibly for seismic design. And this is not seismic, just gravity in this case. <clears throat> that truss you see there supports this building in Boston. It's a 38-story building, and 35 stories sit on those trusses. This was uh, done about 2000, so it's up. It's been in operation for probably the best part of 10 years. A vertical bracing connection is a highly indeterminate system, which is, which is why there's more than a single way to do these. And here's a way. <clears throat> the uniform force method, which is the one that was adopted by the AISC manual committee. <clears throat> what you see here in this picture is what's called an admissible force field. What is that? An admissible force field is an internal force distribution in equilibrium with the applied external forces. The load path that, that, that exists in this connection is completely defined by the admissible force field. The admissible force field that I'm talking about in here, you know, it's basically what? We're talking about free body diagrams. You would be surprised how many engineers, new engineers that we hire that do not know how to do a free body diagram. They think they do, but they do not. Anyway, admissible force field is a kind of mathematical term to just kind of concisely say what we're talking about here. We're talking about a distribution of forces within the structure within a connection that's in equilibrium with the applied forces. And every part of the structure, every part of the connection is in equilibrium under those forces, and the load path is defined by those forces. When, when you use a, a program like ram steel, what you're basically coming up with is an admissible internal force field that also satisfies the compatibility and, uh, and the, uh, the limit states, the, the, the constraints but it may not be the true internal distribution of forces. It's, a, it's an admissible one. So how do we, but for the uniform force method that you just saw, how do we know this is the force distribution in the connection? And the answer is we don't. We don't know that that's the true distribution any more than you do in your, in your ram steel solution. <clears throat> and it probably isn't. However, a guy by the name of Jim Wooten a long time ago made this statement. 
I think Jim died about a year ago, that steel is smarter than the engineers who design it. And I never really understood quite what he meant by that. I'm not really sure what he did. We can't ask him now since he's gone. But when I was in a, a, an undergraduate 50 odd years ago, we had a, an invited lecturer from one of the design offices in New York City that gave us a lecture on, on steel design and he said something like, you know, you should realize that you can design a structure any way you want and it'll behave the way you want it to behave. And I always thought that was nonsense. How can that be? It's going to behave the way that it wants to behave. But it's absolutely true, provided that you satisfy the first principles. And the first principle I'm talking about here is the lower bound theorem, which says that the applied external loads, forces, in equilibrium with the internal force field, the admissible force field, are less than or at most equal to the applied external force that would cause failure, provided that all the limit states are satisfied, and sufficient ductility exists to allow redistribution, redis, redis, redistribution of the forces. And that last part, that caveat about ductility, is absolutely critical. You've got to have some ductility for this to be true. So, let's talk about that in a minute. Another way to state it is, given an admissible internal force field, which I've already defined, and you satisfy all the limit states, and if provided that you have sufficient ductility, the load in equilibrium with the internal force field is less than or at most equal to the connection capacity. Now, how do we satisfy ductility? Well, there's a lot of ductile limit states. There are some that are less ductile than others. Those that we anticipate to be fairly non-ductile or brittle, like fillet wells transversely loaded, we add a factor. We make the wells bigger than they need to be. That was the, the genesis of the so-called rigid factor or ductility factor or overstrength factor for transversely loaded fillet wells and bracing connections. If it's a, a buckling, make the, make the, uh, the members uh, strong enough that they, they won't buckle before something else yields and allows the loads to, to distribute. The load in equilibrium with the internal force field is less than or at most equal to the connection or structure capacity. And I think really this is the basis of all structural design, whether you realize it explicitly or implicitly or whatever. We really do not know the forces in our structures. If we were designing them out of ceramics or glass or something like that, we'd have big problems. You, some of you may have seen a lecture yesterday by, by Professor Engelhart, where he had a, a, a bridge, steel bridge that was hit by a truck and the thing deformed like hell, but nothing, nothing really broke. It didn't, there were no fractures, it, it was ductile. If it was made out of uh, glass, or possibly even concrete, maybe not if it's got enough reinforcing in it, it would have been a different story. There's a corollary to the lower bound theorem, which really is I think what we, what we use most of the time, the admissible internal force field that maximizes the connection capacity is closest to the collapse solution. So that means no matter what internal force distribution you pick, if you keep picking others, the one that maximizes the strength of your connections closest to the truth. And this is a, an example which is animated, but I don't think it's going to work, but it's a simple three bar structure. The bars all have the same strength, they're connected to a rigid block. Each bar can carry 33 and a third kips. So you intuitively know that the strength of this is 100 kips. The one, two, and three, each bar equally loaded. But that's only one of an infinity of admissible internal force fields. And so I had an animation here that would go through this and create a graph, but unfortunately it's not working. So the next one kind of just shows you the final picture. If I say that X is the percent of the load carried by the center member, and I plot it, as you see here, when X is zero, in other words, the middle member carries nothing, the outer two can carry their capacity, the strength of this thing is 66.67 kips. If I go to the other extreme and I say that the middle one carries all the load, that's the one at the bottom, X equals one, 100%, the others carry nothing. The strength of this 
uh, structure is 33 and a third. And if I go starting from from zero and 10 percent, 13 percent, 25 percent, 33 percent, and 33 percent, I hit the peak, and then I start decreasing again. Every one of these is an admissible internal force field. The lower bound theorem of limit analysis requires that we satisfy equilibrium, which is the admissible internal force field, and the limit states, which are ductile in this case. But it does not require us to satisfy compatibility. And the only one of these solutions that you see here that satisfies compatibility is the one where they're each loaded to a third. Because obviously the first one, with, that's got no load in it, the other two are going to stretch. What's going to happen to the, to, to, the, to the middle one? It's like it's cut. It's like it's cut and the thing moves down and it just sits there. It's not doing anything for you. Another example. Suppose we look at the parallel force method, which is one of about four that are in, in existence today. Basically, the parallel force method requires that the forces at the gusset the column and gusset to beam be parallel to the reaction, be parallel to the, to the brace force. So I got a one-on-one -on -one here, so the geometry is simple. And this is the internal force field, admissible internal force field for the parallel force method. And so you can see up there, the gusset to column, you've got 79 kips horizontal, 79 kips vertical, slope is one-on-one. -on -one. When you come to the gusset to beam, you've got 134 kips, 134 kips, again one on one. The resultant forces on the gusset edges at the center of the gusset edges are parallel to the brace. The problem with this method is the 79 kips that you see perpendicular to the web of the column. How do you calculate, how would you carry that? And also this method's got some moments that you see in the members, 1,340 and, 100 and 670 in the, in the column. The design, if you were to use the uniform force method, this is the internal force field, admissible internal force field. And because of the way it's set up, the uniform force method recognizes that we're going to a column web and we do not want to put load perpendicular to that column web. So you see 125 kips as a shear up there, gusset to column and no axial. But when you come down to the gusset to, to, to beam, you see a much bigger load, a 212 instead of 134 that you saw before for the shear. This would be the design for the parallel force method. You've got all kinds of stiffeners and doublers, but that is a perfectly acceptable design. And this would be the design for the, for the uniform force method. These are both perfectly acceptable designs based upon different internal force fields. Just like the three bar structure, we had a whole bunch of them. You know, with uh, one bar loaded to two bar load, lo bars loaded to three bars loaded, and percentages in between. You can, you can take any structure you want and apply an admissible internal force field to it and see what your capacity is. And doing that, the capacity that the internal force field that maximizes the capacity of the connection or the structures closest to the collapse solution. So if we were looking at load pads have consequences, the UFM, uniform uh, force method, design with the UN, uniform force method admissible internal force would give me a capacity here of about 320 kips. And if I took that same design, the UFM design, but I use the parallel force method admissible force, I'd only get a capacity of about 30 kips out of it. So, there's no one way to do this, but there are better ways than others. If you take any piece of hardware and apply different internal force fields, the one that maximizes the strength of what you've got is closest to the truth. In a sense, the uniform force method is sort of the greatest lower bound for this type of, of detail. I mean, that you never get to, to the actual collapse solution, but you can get close to it. That's called the greatest lower bound. So let's look at bracing connections, art, and science. For the science, we, we basically just covered it, in my opinion. It's got mostly to do with, with, with limit states, uh, with the lower bound theorem of limit analysis, you know, with admissible internal force fields. And the art of all this is to pick the best one. I mean, as I said before, as a fabricator engineer, I want to come up with one that's safe, but I also want to come up with one that is as economic as possible. 
What is the optimal load path? <clears throat> In the theory, the one that maximizes the com connection capacity. And as practice, the one that minimizes the cost. And, and these are usually the same, happily. So let's look at some of these methods now. I've already mentioned the parallel force method, but we'll go through three of them now. The KISS method. Perfectly acceptable way to do this. It's, it's the keep it simple stupid method. It was originally promulgated by American Bridge and Bethlehem Steel probably 40 years ago. You see the couples there, M sub C and M sub B, they didn't put those couples on there though. But for any old timers in here, you're probably used to doing this by just taking the vertical component of the brace and putting it on the gusset to column connection and the horizontal component of the brace, H, and putting it on the gusset to beam, and that's it. But that is not an admissible internal force field unless I put those moments in the beam and the column, which I could do. I don't have to have them on the interfaces. I could put these moments in the beam and the column. But whenever I do that, the engineer says, no, no, you can't do that. I assume that I had a concentric system here. All the members meet at a work point. I don't have any extra capacity for any moments in my beam or column. So therefore, you've got to do this. I think that in years past, people didn't pay attention to all this. Bill McGuire in his book, uh, Steel Connections or Steel Design, was, was talking about why a shop bolted a double clip uh, shear connection does not consider eccentricity, but a shop welded one does. And the only reason is history. He says that the shop bolted one does not consider eccentricity because people at that time, when they derived from rivets, did not have any feel for the quote unquote, the niceties of structural mechanics. But after World War II, we had a feeling for that nicety. And I think this KISS method is the same way. When this was first developed, probably 50 years ago, or more, maybe more, maybe even before World War II, I don't know. Nobody considered the niceties of structural mechanics. But you cannot do that. If you're going, I mean, you, it might work nine out of 10 times, but there's gonna be a time when it doesn't. Then there's the parallel force method, which is a perfectly acceptable method. It works really good if you go on a column flanges. It does not work very well at all if you go to column webs. And it also has a couple, M that you see here, and this couple is required. It's not something that goes away. You saw that in my, in my first example of the parallel force method. I put it in the beam and the column, but I couldn't put it between the gusset and the beam and the gusset and the column, but then I wouldn't really have a parallel force method. But I could have what you see here, just putting it on the interfaces. It's either there or it's in the members. That method was first promulgated by a guy named Dave Ricker that I know of probably about 1980-85. Then there's the uniform force method which comes really from work by Ralph Richard back in about 1985-87. And uh, there's another one that, that, that on the west coast that some people use called the truss analogy method which I don't really want to discuss here because I think it's counterintuitive. Anyway, let's look at cost. How about, I said, you know, the best method is the one that minimizes cost. Let's compare, we've already compared parallel to, to uniform. Let's compare KISS to uniform for an example that you'll find in the 13th edition manual CD, examples for the CD. This is the example. It's a heavy old bracing connection for a boiler house. It's a job we did in the Midwest a long time ago. This gives you the design by the keep it simple stupid method. It is a simple method but it does not give you generally an economic design. Or the UFM, which is a bit more complex, but it gives you a much more economic design. In this case, if you had a building that was 40 stories and you had about 32 of these and on each floor, say, say two cores with 16 per core, four per side, uh, you'd be talking about on the order of a quarter of a million dollars difference in price, and that's just in fabrication. In erection, interference, with utilities and things of that sort, probably be a, a lot more than that. Here's a job that we did a few years ago in Georgia. These are a couple of power plants where they were putting SCRs, adding them, some kind of uh, scrubbers, I guess. Every single connection that you see here, and there's hundreds if not thousands of bracing connections in this, and you can see in this slide we're, we're done by 
the uniform force method rather than the KISS method and variations of the uniform force method. Larry Muir's got some variations on this that are really even more economic than the uniform force method per se, but the original bid, the original estimate that the engineers made for this assumed really, really heavy KISS method connections. This job came in two million dollars below the cost that they estimated. This was a unit price job. It was not a fixed lump sum job. And so they had some estimate that we didn't know, but we just did the best we could. And we were told after we were done that we did that we that we saved them two million dollars. Okay, the final topic that I've got here is some seismic seismic bracing connections. If you can, you should avoid seismic. Sorry to say. <laughs> I mean, up, we've had jobs where the seismic, seismic detailing and just that increases the cost of the steel by about 40%. We've had some 17%, but the worst one we had was something like 40% increase in the cost of the steel. And when the steel costs that much more, everybody wants to know why. I mean, you know, the, the owner got some price from the, from the engineer and we got some, we, we gave the engineer some price and probably we qualified our bid to say that we'll do this but not that. And when it came all the way down to it, I know, I know on this job it was 40% increase and they were, we were called, called into meetings to explain why. That's one problem. The other problem is that even when the provisions seem clear, they give unanticipated results. You saw some of those this morning uh, in, a, in, in one talk. But you saw this one too. I mean, that, that was a seismic design. Supposedly, supposedly, uh, what do you call it, ductile. Supposedly a ductile design. Obviously not ductile. But it satisfies the letter designed for the strength of the members. And the engineers, they, they just read what the letter says. They may not know why. I mean, look at the size of the columns on this thing. There's no way the columns could even develop the strength of the braces. Anyway, unanticipated results. Here's another one. The intention of, of the requirements for seismic braced frames is that significant deformations will occur through yielding in the brace. Just look at that. The next one shows that there's only nine inches of the brace remaining between the connection elements. For time you've got to reinforce the net section to, to get it to be greater than, the, than, the, than the, the yield of the gross section. And you got that at both ends. You end up with <clears throat> really a mess, very expensive. The entire section, the remaining section, other than that nine inches, is reinforced due to the net area checks. There's, there's some, some move afoot, I think, to maybe help a little bit on this in the next edition of the provisions, but this is the way it is right now. This configuration satisfies the provisions, which are AISC 34105, the cost of the structure has been greatly increased over what we normally would have done. However, there's a pretty good likelihood that this detail will be detrimental to the seismic performance of the structure. So the owner's paying money for the seismic detailing, but it's no guarantee that it's going to really do what it's supposed to do. And I doubt that it will when you only have nine inches of a part that's, that can stretch. The 2T requirement, you end up with what people call bond door. Uh, gusset plates, huge bloody gusset plates in order to accommodate the 2T. Now you might be able to make these smaller. This one was set up with the usual 30 degree spread for the Whitmore section. But there's nothing magic about that. We could have used a 20 degree spread or a 10 degree spread and that would have helped. But I think when, when these connections are done, the, people don't realize how big they are and where they're going, where, what, what's going to happen and 30 degrees is pretty much the standard so they're done that way, they're de detailed that way and by the time somebody sees it, it's really you know, too late or somebody's going to have to pay to change it. Again, the final result is not consistent with the performance goals of the provisions. I mean you've got just a little piece in the middle there that's actually ductile. But, I mean, we can work together with the engineer and we can get some good results. By applying common sense and a team-oriented team approach, we could uh, 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 get an acceptable balance uh, between performance and economy. 
And that's what happened on this job. I believe this job was in Nevada. We used the 2T requirement that you see there in the lower part where we had lots of room. And that's shown in the 2T in the, in the red box. And then up on the top, you'll see the brace was rotated and designed for weak axis moment at heavily loaded members and areas of tight geometry. Imagine seeing the two T gussets up there in that much smaller panel. So what we did was we, we rotated the members so they buckle in plane instead of out of plane. And this kind of shows you a schematic of what we did. That brace is flange to view. We have a couple of plates that are welded to the across the toes of the flanges. And then that those that is then slipped between the the plates that extend off the gusset plate. You can see them in this picture here, you can see them extending off, off the gusset plate. The braces are just slipped in there laterally, like this, and all bolted together. And that worked pretty slick. So you don't need to have, you no, know, you do not need to have gussets with the 2T. You do not have to have your braces buckle at a plane. But that's what almost everybody does. But it might be more economic, especially if you've got problems with trying to see through this bracing, you don't want to have everything meeting in the middle, to do what you see up at the top. Rotate the braces so they buckle in plane. Then, of course, you have to design for the R sub Y, F sub Y, A sub G, and you also have to design for 1.1 times R sub Y, times M sub P sub Y, right? The weak axis moment. But it turns out, according to research that was done, I think, in Canada, that you don't have to do the two together. And as of right now, at least the last ballot that we did on the latest provisions, the axial force and the moment, weak axis moment, can be treated independently of each other. And the reason for that is that the moment doesn't exist when the brace is in tension. It exists when the brace is in compression, because when it's it brace is in compression, that's when it buckles and the compression load is like 20 or 30 percent. So if you've designed it for already 100 percent, the moment is probably trivial. In fact, every case I've ever looked at, the moment is not controlled. Anyway, that, that's a good way to go. This particular detail, I believe, is in the seismic design manual in one of the examples. There's something new that's coming up, though, that I think you're going to see more and more of. I don't know what we're going to do about it, but seismic drift is really a big problem. I mean, it's kind of handled with moment connections now by, by pre-qualified connections and things of that sort. But we don't have any requirements right now in the seismic provisions for drift. The seismic drift can be 10 times what, it, what, you're, normal, what you're used to. I mean, the normal drift in a building, the way we used to design them, was like 1 over 500. That's 0.2%. Seismic drift that we're shooting for, as far as I know, is about 2.5% drift, which is 1 in 40. That is one hell of an increase in the drift. And that then causes problems. And you can see that in this kind of uh, schematic showing what happens when you get that much drift. You can see the, the gusset and the column occupying the same space, which is impossible, so something's going to give. The column encroaches, encroaches on the gusset and something must give. You get develop what are called variously distortional forces. And this particular diagram here is, is, is one that, that I think is about the simplest one you can come up with. It shows you kind of the pinching forces, F sub D. This distribution is consistent with the uniform force method. You can just add these algebraically to what you get out of the uniform force method. There's some research now that was published a couple of years ago in an AISC journal that indicated that the gussets can buckle even when the brace is in tension. And this is a picture of that. We have a design guide, Larry Muir and I, that kind of tries to predict this with the formula that you see here, which is buckling of a, of a plate that, that's embedded in the gusset plate. We've used this to try to come up with, did we come close to predicting this? Yeah, we came close, but we didn't actually predict it, so maybe, maybe it's, it's a step in the right direction, but more needs to be done. 
Anyway, distortional forces. What are distortional forces? They're forces that have always been there, that you've neglected. You can go all the way back to 1950s textbooks where they have, say, a truss, and the truss is designed like the one I showed you, the pin connections, as though it's pinned. But in reality, it's all welded together or bolted together, so you get what are called secondary forces or secondary stresses. Those are the distortional forces. They're also called frame action forces. They're also called kinematic displacements. There's a lot of different names for the same thing. When we had drifts of 0.2%, they were generally negligible. The highway bridge code spec says, and that's basically you know, elastic design, that if the length to the width of a member in the plane of bending is something on the order of like 20 to 1, you can ignore secondary stresses in, in, in a lot of cases, maybe not always. But with 2.5% drift, you know, that's more than 10 times what we're used to, you can't do it anymore. So how do we do it? Distortional forces, we can control them. We know they're there. How are we going to control them? We could control them with the strength of the connection, which I'm saying is undesirable. We could control them with the bending strength of the beam and the column, which is really not that desirable either. Or we can de design them with the introduction of a fuse. But this would be one way to control by member strength, which is, I don't recommend this. I mean, imagine actually building this thing you would have no distortional forces that, you would, that have not been considered with this connection because every single weld is full pen. The strength of the members are developed, so any distortional forces that exist are taken care of. It's very expensive. There's no gusset. Drift and distortional forces, not an issue with a question mark. I've also got a subtitle to this one as being the ideal engineers, engineer of records bracing connection. Why would that be? No calculations. No calculations. You could put that on your drawing and it's out the bloody door. You don't have to do anything. But the fabricator wouldn't be bad for us either. No big deal. The erector? Ah, the erector's going to go through the ceiling trying to put this thing together. Remember, these are all CJP wells. That means they all have to be ultrasonically tested, and imagine trying to test these things in this configuration. You're talking about lots of money to do this. You can control them by putting in a pin, making the thing act the way you, you've assumed it is, that it's, that, that it's a pinned frame. I mean, a braced frame is really just a vertical truss. So you could put in a pin that, uh, that, that relieves the distortional forces. Or you might do something like this, which also relieves the distortional forces the moment. Here's a connection that's done with the current provisions without consideration of distortional forces. This is in the design guide that Larry Muir and I are writing. It'll be out early, later this year. For that particular connection, the distortional forces are about 600 kips. They really will affect this, and it may buckle the, uh, the gusset in pinching. The current provisions, the current provisions, the pinching forces is uh, six, about 600 kips, based on beam strength, and the, the buckling load of that gusset is about 400, 400 and a quarter. So it probably will buckle, like you saw on a previous slide. We could introduce a fuse. You know, in seismic, you want to have a ductal fuse, and we could put a fuse in there. If I put that fuse that you see there, which is significant. I'm reducing the distortional forces from 600 to 200, about a third of what I had before. With the fuse, the gusset pinching force is about, the buckling force is about 200, though the actual force is about 200. The actual buckling strength is about twice that, five and a quarter. The gusset won't buckle. So we have, there are some ways, that, rational ways that we can handle this. I said before, low seismic. This is exactly the same location, exactly the same location, but with R equal to 3. The other one was R equal 6, or 5 and a half. Look at the difference in that connection and any one of these. And you can see that you're talking about a lot of money for seismic detailing. Do you need it? If you need it, so be it. All right, summary. Connections account for about 50% of the cost of erected steel. Rational design 
of connections requires engineering knowledge. You cannot depend upon anybody else's software to do this for you. You better know how to do it. You should design connections for the actual loads, not member strengths. Now, in seismic, that's not true. Usually, you want to design for member strengths. But in ordinary, R equals 3 or less, or you know, non-seismic, design for the actual loads if you want the most economic structure. Design of bracing connections for seismic drifts will require new approaches. The title Last Bastion is used to emphasize that little software is available for complex connection design. And I, I've given you some examples of that. And I'd like to thank Surveyors Corporation for supporting me in this, and also uh, Larry Muir, ex-colleague ex, uh, and continuing friend and collaborator for a lot of the ideas that you saw here. And for AISC for inviting me to speak on my favorite topic, any fool, et cetera. And then you've got this one, <laughs> which is one of, one of ours. That's a platform brace. That, you know, a little platform brace looking down through a grating floor. That's what you would see. Look at the brace. The brace is a WT, and you've got big, bloody gusset plates. I mean, this was such a joke that one of the guys in the shop picked it up and wanted to be photographed with it as a ridiculous connection. So anyway, connections, the last bastion of rational design. You know, pick something. Those of you that are interested, you know, are younger, that, that want to get involved in something, pick something. I think connections is a great place because there's all kinds of things that you can do. A lot of you more recent graduates, graduates may feel that, that especially undergraduates, that there's not, nothing to do, everything's done. Nothing could be further from the truth. There's all kinds of stuff out there in steel design, connections in particular, that's not understood. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>